Great, thank you, George. Um, lots to, for me anyway, lots to talk about. I will, uh, I will let other people start uh, before I eat up the remaining time. Are there <laughs> any questions from the audience, either in the room or other folks joining online? Comments? Okay. I have. I have a question about the, I mean, I don't want to go into technical details because we can talk afterwards, but when you were producing these uh, occurrence models, mm -hmm. uh, the way you build them up is basically by data that you have and then looking at the properties of the environment where the animal was found or? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So basically it's like doing a logistic regression in which I took the presence or absences of pseudo absences of the animal, right? And then I correlated that with, I tried to explain that by the different variables of like a pluviosity and stuff on that pixel. So basically the more layers of environmental correlates that you have, the more accurate is your model. That's the thing. I assume so, although most of those models, they have a way to control. They, they do some basic feature selection. So you don't end up with a, with a model of 500 uh, different variables. Yeah, that was my worry. How do you control for over, I don't know, over? Yeah. No, no, definitely it's 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 an issue. But for example, the max sense, uh, which is basically just a logistic regression, but it has two penalization factors. So if you have a term that has very little influence, I think it's basically reduced to zero, right? It minimizes not only the least square, but also the the size of the parameters that you have. So you can have only very big parameters or parameters that are zero. Like it does that into, in, include that into the calculation. And the way of testing the accuracy of those models is basically once you have the prediction map, mm -hmm. you go there to the field and try to see whether... That, that would be ideal, but what most 90% of the papers on that area do is that they do a out of, out of sample prediction. So basically they yes. create a model of 70% of the data and then test how good it can predict the accuracies of the remaining 30%. So, yeah, basically all those techniques for deciding how many uh, covariates to include have some element of fit that you want to <laughs> maximize and some uh, penalty in, uh, that, that's incurred every time you add more stuff to the model. Mm -hmm. so you're trying to find, uh, you're trying to minimize an aggregate cost that measures um, deviation from the data uh, and also how complex the model is getting. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the different ways of doing that that make different assumptions and weight things differently, but pretty much all model selection uh, techniques have, have that combination of factors uh, involved mm -hmm. to stop the kind of runaway selection that, uh, that you were asking about, Ricardo. Mm -hmm. um, I would add uh, to that that and the, the theme of um, using uh, tracking data together with occurrence data. Um, that's actually something I have a, a US National Science Foundation grant on that's ending very soon. Uh, it's been going on now for over three years. Um, and and the, 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 the way we think about it is that um, you know, like the GBIF data, the occurrence data, tell you a lot about where an animal has been seen, but it's subject to some unknown biases. Like, like uh, Georges said, you, you don't really know in an area where you haven't seen the animal if it's actually not there, or nobody looked, or somebody looked but just didn't see it. Um, so you, you have this sort of unknown bias. And if you put GBIF data down on a map, you find that it often uh, correlates with roads and rivers and paths basically places where people go and places that are harder for people to get tend not to have any occurrence records. And you can think of animal tracking data as kind of having the opposite set of biases. So if you put a device on an animal, it will sample the environment in a way that a person won't. It will get into those places where people don't go um, and you can learn something about uh, how often it goes there. But unlike uh, the occurrence data, it's highly correlated. So the track movement points in a movement track are correlated with each other. And then they're all tied. Every given track is tied to one individual. 
So you have a sort of independence problem. But anyway, you can you can balance those things and use them in a in a sort of data integration way in the same model to try to trade off uh, or, or, or let's say compensate the weaknesses of one with the other data type. And if you get them in the right mix, you can get surprisingly better inferences about species distribution. So that's something that we're working on, have been working on. Uh, and the paper that kind of puts that all together uh, is, is coming soon. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about, I mean, you, you alluded to this towards the end. One of the issues with uh, optimal foraging theory is it sort of assumes this kind of omniscience of the mm -hmm. environment, like all your critters just happen to know where all the resources are and how much is there at any given time and can make informed decisions about where to go, which is, of course, not how things work in reality. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, uh, you know, in the last few years, there's been a lot of work on spatial memory and animal cognition and how animals learn about their environment and perceive the environment. I'm wondering if there's been anything that kind of puts those pieces together, classical optimal foraging theory, modifying it to account for animal cognition, cognitive maps, spatial learning, and things like that that have been more recent themes in, in movement ecology. Yeah, as far as I'm aware, there has been some attempts to incorporate learning, even relatively old ones, especially, for example, one of the common ones that I've seen is trying to model animals has what they call Bayesian foragers. So they have like a little Bayesian updating function that keeps changing. Every time they visit a new patch, they, they update what they think is the average of the environment. But I haven't seen anything so fancy of, uh, as for example, incorporating spatial cognitive maps. The, the highest level of uh, mathematics I've seen so far is just that Bayesian updating as far as I'm aware. One uh, relevant thing um, I started working on with Mike Noonan back at when, and when I was at the Smithsonian and Mike was in a postdoc in my lab was uh, developing estimators of habitat time budgets from mm -hmm. tracking data. So being able to say, you know, estimate how much of a animal's foraging time they're spending in this kind of environment or that kind of environment. Um, mm -hmm that got kind of put on the back burner. Um, we worked out mm -hmm. the first pass of it and it's kind of sat on the back burner, but we just revived it for this ERC synergy grant that we submitted together uh, a couple of weeks ago. Nice. And I think it's gonna go forward at some time, but that maybe mm -hmm. that's uh, you know, a, a sort of tractable way to move mm -hmm. forward with um, you know, injecting some spatial realism into optimal foraging theory in a way that you're just not, you're no longer assuming that everybody knows everything and can get everywhere. Um, yeah. No, it sounds like, boy, if I can read that, uh, that stuff later, it would be great. Like, I'm yeah. curious. Yeah. yeah, I can show, we have a grant proposal we wrote back at the Smithsonian and, uh, and then that was funded, but Mike ended up getting a faculty position, so didn't actually take the funding for it. And then the, the, uh, ERC grant has that we just submitted has a little bit of that in there, but uh, anyway, it might be something you know. There, there might be some interesting opportunities there to put those two things together. No, definitely. Like I really feel that this this should be the next step in foraging ecology, like because we're really good now at disentangling the effects of you know a myriad of stuff. Like I remember that in, in the place I did my PhD, people now figure out like what is the difference in perceived predation risk from a an owl that has been painted black from an owl that is completely white. So we can get to very, very finer details on that, but we still don't know how to translate all this patch theory to space, right? So it really feels that this should be the next step. And yeah, I'm hoping also that, you know, this idea of the, of the target visitation problem could also be a way to approach that, although your, your way sounds more uh, mathematically tractable. Maybe just complementing, I think that there is a res recent paper, I don't know if it's 2019 or 20, I don't know, but very recent where they they study uh, the search problem of a, of a population of, of, of foragers in a patchy environment. And basically what every forager is able to do is based on their experience on detection, they somehow start learning the statistical 
the spatial statistical properties of the landscape, of the patchy landscape. Uh -huh. And in that way, they show how combining experience with uh, exploration, uh -huh. like the blind exploration, they can optimize the number of encounters in a in a patchy environment. I think that is the most recent nice. paper I know. Uh, and instead of what I, what I thought was <laughs> very interesting is that the, what the animals learn instead of the landscape itself mm -hmm. is somehow, which I don't know how realistic it is, uh -huh. somehow the parameters of the distribution. structure of the of the landscape rather than the landscape itself, rather than saying, ah, they... I, I, I've seen a paper that I, I don't think it dig it into that level of detail, but it was just the paper of uh, investigating how one animal would learn about the environment, but I think the he basically started with you know uh, a, a wrong idea about what is the average of the environment, the average resource per patch, and then he would use the linear operator, the Bayesian updating to kind of improve from it. But what this paper was tracking was actually looking if if you should start with you know. A lower estimation of the average, if you would, if you should be wrong by underestimating, or if you should be wrong by overestimating. And they found that the animals that overestimated actually have bigger fitness because they, yeah, because they they left the patch earlier, and so they explored the environment more, and then they learned with more. Uh, they learned the actual parameters of the environment quicker, so. Yeah, it seems that this paper actually went a step further and did for the entire population, which is... Yeah, what I don't remember now is whether... Uh, so I don't remember if there was somehow interactions uh, they, or if they just used an ensemble of, of guys. Uh, I don't remember where the, the fact of considering the population came uh -huh. came into. But uh, yeah, I can't take, I mean, or I can send you the paper. It's not, yeah, it's, 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 it's super, it, I, what I remember is that it is very, it's basically based on simulations. It's very heavy computationally, but I did like the details. I... No, it sounds, sounds pretty great. Yeah, yeah that's the other thing. Like... Group it came from. Huh? So this was from a computer science uh, group in Belgium. In... Okay. It's actually one of the guys I, I sent you uh the cv a few ah, right. months yeah, yeah. ago johannes yeah. actually yeah. i think where the interactions come from is through competition for the resources so i think that the whenever they found a patch they consume it so then basically depending on how yeah it's basically competition amazing yeah no i, I don't think that the one that i've seen had that so it's it's a new step but this is also something like the one i've seen was also simulation we still don't have like a an algebraic way to, to find those those calculations. And we don't have something as simple as with the marginal value theorem, like this beautiful formula that you know gives us the prediction and that's it. I feel that if we could get there, that would make it much more sellable to the other ecologists that are less uh, uh, computational oriented. So yeah, this is also a, yeah, something I, I've been thinking like how, how to translate all those Computational heavy things into simple mathematical predictions that you can sell. Yeah, I think even considering like the most basic spatial constraints. So one of the problems we're working is uh, optimal foraging by plant roots. Mm -hmm. and they are very nice. I saw some papers about it. And there, it's a, you have a very uh, strong but also clear constraint that is that if there a plant wants to exploit a patch at a given location. She has to build a route mm -hmm. until reaching there. So it's not free anymore. You cannot jump. You have to, yeah. to, to spread and build. And when you have that small addition, then all the optimal the marginal value theorem, I mean, it's still valid in some limits, but yeah, no, it breaks. So considering movement limitations that are more complex than assuming that you are building a tube in one dimension, uh, it, yeah, it will give a lot of more interesting insights. Indeed. Yeah. And just um no any well, anybody else have questions or comments for George? I have one more if nobody else does, but nothing. Okay. Um I, I was 
it's just thinking about the link between um, optimal foraging theory and uh, the ecology of fear story. And, and I, I, I mean, I, I, you know, these are things that I learned about in grad school, um, you know, but never did really any research on. So I'm, I'm not aware what the, the current state of the art is there. But it seems to me like if you are inferring fear or some kind of behavioral response as a, you know, to, to minimize predation, mm -hmm. um, suboptimal foraging, right? Not exploiting patches that you should exploit, but staying away from them. Um, and you're assuming omniscience, like where the animal just knows everything everywhere. It seems like there's a potential to confound sort of ignorance of where the good resources are with fear of, you know, knowing that, but avoiding those areas anyway. You know what I mean? Like, cool. mm -hmm. is there, are, are, are people working on that? Or is there, there, you know, have people done experiments or, you know, explored uh, the potential for that, that kind of confounding of those two different things to occur? Um, it seems to me like it would kind of set an upper limit on how much fear there, you know, you know, behavioral response there could be, but not necessarily be, um, you know, an accurate estimator of the actual amount of caution that the animal is exhibiting. So, like, uh, as far as I'm aware, there has been some studies, but on on how learning is happening, on the, how the animals are predating it, but it has been more focus on this idea of separating like what type of uh, learning model better represents uh, the way that animals learn about the energy over time. What I've seen in terms of protecting against that effect is just the fact that usually those experiments are done in, in those vivariums that have very limited uh, area. So one can assume that you know the animal has enough time to learn about the environment. But there is some effect, for example, it's very common on those experiments, as far as I'm aware, that the more time passes, the lower the giving up density becomes because the animals are starting to learn how to forage, right? But, and if learn is always gonna be on that direction, then we have the fact that, you know, predation risk usually works on the opposite direction by increasing the giving up density, by uh, decreasing the amount of food. So, that's kind of a haphazard way of fixing the issue by basically having them point into opposite directions. But it is an issue. Like the, the issue with, with giving up density is that everything can influence giving up density, not only predation risk. We just assume that predation risk is the biggest influencer. Has there been any um, study or that's how certain like additional sensors that you can collect data from the animal beyond mm -hmm. just the tracking that look at stress hormones or stress levels that can be used to see where the animal, obviously in, in certain areas where it's more stress, maybe potentially because of mm -hmm. predator. Uh, people, people have done that and, and there is an effect, like they, they measure cortisol on the feces and they found that, yeah, there is usually an effect that if they are below a bush, in the case of the gerbils, they, they have a uh, higher cortisol effect, uh, higher cortisol production. But, and, and I have also seen a very cool paper about uh, landscapes of fear that basically instead of measuring giving up density, he did the, your rational, but on the opposite direction. They inserted the measure of the heart rates inside of bears. And then they saw that as the bears get close to the city, the heart rates increases. So they can measure the fear based on the stress, based on the heart rate measure. So it's pretty cool uh, idea. So people have tried other sensors, right? But another thing that people often do is to put a camera in front of the patch, like that one, and basically measure how long the animal has been foraging. So then you can use the hauling disk equation to decompose the, the time, the speed into two parameters, the handling time, how long it takes for it to eat one seed, and the vision and this uh, speed in which they can find new seeds within the patch. And then uh, 
people have used this other metric, the, the, the attack rate, the frequency in which they find the seeds has inverse of the vigilance, basically. So the more vigilance animals should find seeds slower. So there has been some, let's say, other sensors being used on the process, but yeah. There is also, uh, there is also people that what they do is they, they track the other way around. So following the introduction, the reintroduction of, um, I don't know, a predator in a, in an environment or an ecosystem, how the prey changed the, the behavior. They did it in, in Mozambique because there is this uh, following the war, there was uh, this national park that was empty of uh, predators, basically. And now as they were reintroducing a species and tracking the, the changes in the population size, because it was the whole park was controlled, mm -hmm. they could uh, track the, I think it was three different types of uh, antelopes and basically how they were changing their space, their, their space utilization and their movement behavior based on how they were becoming more aware of predators and they were getting more and more scared. Nice. Was, um, the wow, this looks like. Yeah, no, it, it really feels that boy, movement data is the is the future for foraging and ecology, right? Like it, it can give us that uh, level of tractability that we never had. And hopefully we can even figure out what are the patches from uh, tracking data. And then yeah, then it's only happiness, then it's actually proving that it still it works, hopefully. <laughs> okay, I think we are just about out of time. Uh, if there's any last question or comment, uh, last chance. I don't see anything. Um, so I will thank George again for the nice talk and, and the audience for joining and for the nice discussion. and. See you all soon. Have a nice afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming.